One of Canada's most successful labor leaders joins us today on the Ryerson Negotiation Project. Buzz Hargrove led the Canadian Auto Workers Union for over 17 years. He has negotiated with some of the biggest corporations in Canada, General Motors, Chrysler, Ford, and Air Canada. Our guest has spent more than 40 years in the field of negotiations. Hargrove, in his own style, addresses some of the issues in the negotiating process, including the development of a mandate, the importance of relationships, probing and listening, and the need to surround yourself with a good team, as well as several other aspects of the negotiating process. My name is David Dingwall, your host, and I welcome you to the Ryerson Negotiation Project. Can you explain as to how the process worked in your union for you to arrive at your mandate and your agenda. I think there's a lot of myths surrounding that Buzz Hargrove and a few of his buddies met in a hotel room and they devised the strategy. Could you share that background with us? Sure, the key uh, to, and certainly in the industrial union setting, is to make sure that the members have input right from the get-go, that when you start to prepare uh, for bargaining, as you head towards the end of a collective agreement, you have membership meetings, we conducted surveys asking people to identify what they thought the priorities of the of the union should be and then prior to submitting our, our proposals to the companies we always had a final membership meeting went through them all again and they were voted on at the end people voted in favor of submitting these uh, as a proposal and that's what i talk about having democratic control of the uh, of the process initially and then of course when bargaining is over you got to go back to that same membership and get a ratification. So they have to, they, they're, they were there as part of putting it in front of the company and they're there at the end to judge how well uh, that you were able to do in, in bargaining. And, and what sort of give and take would take place in terms of uh, having the membership saying, well, these are the 17 things that we want to work on. Uh, how would you interface with your rank and file members by saying, well, you know, that might be a particular concern of yours, but it's not really a concern that we should take to the management at this time. Would that well, take that's place? The one thing I learned very early, never ever say that. <laughs> <laughs> and hope like hell you only get 17, uh, David. No, uh, anyone can put any proposal they want on the table as long as it's endorsed by that initial proposal uh, that goes before the members for final approval. At the end of the day, everybody in that room knows you're not going to walk away with everything that you have on the table. And that's why they elect a bargaining committee. And the bargaining committee then has to take the responsibility at some stage of the bargaining to say, look, we've had all these proposals there. We've made some good progress in the following areas. Other areas, we haven't been able to make any progress, but it's clear that we can't in this set of negotiations. Therefore, we will go to our members and recommend ratification. So going forward, you would have a mandate. You would have a written mandate you would be held accountable for that mandate. And then when you came back after the negotiations, they would have an opportunity to say yay or nay. At the end of the day, they make the final judgment as to whether or not you were able to make enough progress in that round of bargaining to say, uh, we're gonna ratify and those issues that you weren't able to resolve, we'll just keep working on them as a, during the life of the agreement or it may be very well uh, a higher priority at the next set of bargaining. Would you say that that process, in terms of owning the process, was unique to the CAW? Or was that fairly general in terms of the labor movement, both in Canada and the U.S.? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I grew up in a U.S.-based union called the United Auto Workers in those days. Uh, and that was a process they followed during that uh, period of time when I was a youngster, a shop steward, committee person, chairperson. Uh, now, whether that's followed today or whether other unions follow that same process, uh, David, I, I would be, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to comment. I don't know for sure. In your book, which I said I, I've read and I found very interesting, you you reference throughout your book the importance of of relationships. Can you give me a feel as to how important developing relationships internally to the union, and then alternatively the relationships with the other side? prior to negotiations. Yes, the, the, the one thing, David, I've, I, I strongly believe is that if you're going to be the leader of the bargaining committee, you first better understand who you're working with, 
who are these people? What makes them tick? What part of the workplace are they from? What are the issues are there? Are they, are they driven uh, by simply the workers in the workplace saying to them, this is, this is a, a must? Or are they driven by some personal conviction or by uh, the culture, uh, their, their culture or their religion or other, uh, other issues? So you make sure uh, and you spend time. You can't do that over the phone. You've got to spend time with people personally around a table talking through the issues, talking through the bargaining, talking through the strategy, then over dinner, and then in the bar late at night with a few drinks, you always get the most open discussion at that, uh, at that point, and I've done, done it all, and my wife would say probably too much of it <laughs> over, the, uh, over the years. Uh, but that, that, that's absolutely critical uh, for someone who's going to lead the bargaining. And the same thing with the management. You have to know what motivates uh, the management's issues as well. If they, every set of negotiations that I've ever been involved in, the management always have their issues. Now, it's become more pronounced, I think, in the last few years. Matter of fact, almost every major labor dispute in Canada in the last decade has been over management's demands uh, to roll back the clock in a number of areas where the unions made progress over, uh, over the years. We never faced uh, that that much. We had their issues and you had to find a way to deal with them and find a way to make them comfortable and find a way coming out of it uh, even if you couldn't move on their key issues, of making sure you've still kept the re relationship. Uh, I've always said this to our staff and our, our, our bargainers, no matter how small or large the company, uh, remember, don't take undue advantage of your advantage. Never take the last nickel off the table. Uh, that's the relationship nickel. Even if you know you can't, even if you know uh, you, you have the, the upper hand, uh, there's always another time there's always another way, and remember, these are your members' jobs. Uh, and at the end of the day, the people across the table from you, most of them, if your workplace closes, will land on their feet. They'll find a job with some other company somewhere else and probably make more money than they're making today. The little guy in that plant that's making a good, decent wage under a union contract, if he loses or she loses her job, becomes a much uh, different story. Uh, the reverse. Have you found management seeking out labor leaders and the negotiating people to find out more about them in terms of their particular concerns and how they tick? Or was it always you trying to find out about them? Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, my style of leadership is, is aggressive. It's take charge kind of, uh, of leadership. Uh, so it was constantly me getting a hold of management and talking about and getting meetings set up and, and talking. Uh, but I have always found the other side very open, very willing uh, and, 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 and desiring an opportunity to sit with you and kind of get a sense of where you're at and what's it going to take to solve uh, certain, certain issues that they see. For example, we dealt with a lot of American uh, corporations uh, and they were reporting directly to their people constantly during the bargaining. So they wanted to know if, the, if their boss in Detroit, for example, or Washington or Pittsburgh, whatever, uh, uh, was totally opposed in a certain area, they'd want to know where that is before they got in trouble on that issue. And, and they'd want to know if Buzz Hargrove is the leader of the bargaining, saying we have to have this, uh, they want to be able to pass that on to their management. Look, you know, you're telling us on one side, nope, we can't do that. Hargrove's telling us you have to do that. Uh, we're going we're gonna to end up in a fight here unless we can find some way. So for them, absolutely critical, cause, because if they didn't know that, and their manager saying, uh, just hold firm, don't do anything on it, and we end up on strike. First person that calls them is their boss saying, what the hell are you doing? Why didn't you tell me that? So it's critical for them as well to be able to identify what the, what the key concerns of the union are and find out early whether or not they can, uh, they can manage those. Now that you've got your mandate, you've gone through that democratic process, it's been voted on, uh, you understand with all the items that you have to deal with. Tell me about your negotiating team. Who would be on your team? What sort of roles would they have on your team, uh, both before going to the bargaining table as well as at the bargaining table? Well, uh, and I'll talk about the major bargaining today as opposed to a lot of the, the, the smaller bargaining uh, units that I've been involved in over many, many years, David. Our, large, our largest group was General Motors. You call them the giants. They look pretty small today. They look. Uh, they're the, the tallest of the of the midgets, so to speak, uh, today. But they're, they're they're they were giants, but they're pretty small today. And we used to have seven different locations in Canada where General Motors uh, had production. We were in Saint Therese, 
uh, Quebec and Scarborough and Oshawa and Windsor, Woodstock, London, St. Catharines. Um, so we had seven bargaining committees, one from each location. The workers in each plant or each office elect their uh, their members to the uh, bargaining committee. And then we had the, uh, the uh, master bargaining committee, which was, again, elected by the total membership of, uh, of General Motors. They, they elected a certain number of people on their local committee, and then they would elect the, um, the president, the chairperson, and the chairperson of the skilled trades. When they elect, uh, elected them to the bargaining committee, they knew they were going to be on the master bargaining committee, which was the, at, that, at that time was seven, was about 25 people. And then we assigned our specialist to work with them, my assistant. I had an assistant from my office who was responsible for working with the bargaining committees at General Motors and the company on a day-to-day -day basis to work uh, uh, through uh, the issues during the life of the agreement. We had a staff uh, representative. In the case of General Motors, at one point it was large enough, we had two staff representatives working on day-to-day uh, on -day problems, and they would all be involved in the, in the bargaining process. And then we had our pension experts, our health care benefit uh, experts, our economists, our health and safety, our substance abuse expert. We had about a dozen different committees uh, that were struck with the responsibility of meeting with their counterparts in the companies who dealt with those issues on an ongoing basis, on a day-to-day -day basis throughout the life of the agreement. And they would all be very knowledgeable on what the issues were what the problem areas were, and they were struck with the responsibility of taking the demands, meeting with the, their counterparts and working them out. And our structure was every morning at 8 o'clock, we called a meeting of all of the local committees, all the experts that so were there. So there would be the seven committees? Seven committees, and the master committee, plus the master committee. Plus the experts. And plus the experts uh, would be all in the same room, and each one of those committees would give a report. I headed up the top committee. We, we, we commonly referred to that as the finance committee or the review uh, committee, which reviewed all of the issues, not just the, the finance uh, committee. And every morning at 8 o'clock, we'd get a report from every one of those committees. And I would question them when somebody ran into a problem and said, look, we can't get anything done on our issues. And we'd challenge them as to what and why. And, but I also kept notes. And then following that meeting, which usually lasted a couple hours, I would then call my counterpart in the company and say, okay, we have to get together. I, and, and the company did the same thing, by the way. They caucused with their people. So he would be or she would be getting their report. And then we would meet, and I'd say, look, here's what I've, I've identified. Just one-on-one? On one-on-one. One. Sometimes two-on-two, two, sometimes three-on-three, three, depending uh, on, on what it was. No, uh, generally three of us. I'd have the chairperson of the bargaining committee, the secretary treasurer of the union, who was the second top officer in case something happened to the, to the leader. Uh, and, and myself, the three of us would meet. And then if it was short, we're getting down to the, to the final uh, end and there's only four or five issues, then I would meet one-on-one because -on -one, you always get a better uh, sense of where uh, the uh, company's uh, represent is uh, at, at that point. But the big thing was the system was you wouldn't let anybody screw up the bargaining by one committee somewhere uh, just stonewalling, either on my side or his side. So it was helpful for me as a leader of the bargaining to know what the company was saying about why these issues are, are, are not moving. And it was help, obviously just as helpful for, for the chief negotiator for the company to know what I was saying about what caused it. So the when you sat down, whether it was three on three or one on one, you had a pretty good idea as to where you guys stood. Yes. And you had a pretty good idea as to where the company stood Absolutely. on the various issues. Absolutely. Critical. You have to know. You can't, you can't be guessing when you're in major bargaining, and we had it at that time, uh, we had as high as 39,000 hourly rated workers at General Motors. If you're going to take them out on the picket line and take their, their, their paycheck out of their pocket, you better have done your homework. You better have known and tried everything to try to find a, a solution. I'm fortunate. Uh, I, I, I was elected national president in 1992, and the only shutdown I had was in 1996. We had a, a, a shutdown with General Motors for 17 days. Your, uh, your style of negotiations, you, you said in your book, and I, and I think this is, this is very telling, you say business people, especially those MBAs after their names, will lecture that a perfect deal occurs when both sides get what they want out of a bargain. They call it interest-based bargaining, where both sides work towards shared interests. Then I suppose they walk arm in arm to the bar and sip martinis. Maybe that works for the country club set, 
but it never has and never will work for the union management negotiations. Yes, I tell me I, about that. I strongly oppose just the the idea of interest based bargaining, uh, and, and because it was all gimmickry, it was all something. Uh, when, when a company was looking to get the upper hand, they would come and have this idea about interest based bargaining. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story because it's instructive. Uh, we had a young guy uh, uh, who was the vice president of HR for Chrysler Canada, Mark Jendreski. Uh, very bright young guy, very good at bargaining, knew what he was doing. And we'd had, I think, uh, we had our first round of bargaining with him. We got a settlement. It was tough. Bargaining shouldn't be uh, easy when you're dealing with so many issues and so many lives involved. So uh, about a year after the bargaining, he came to me and said, look, I've been talking with these consultants and I'd like you to meet with them. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I think they can help us in bargaining. I said, Mark, we don't need no help. We haven't had a dispute with Chrysler since 1985, I believe it was. And he said, no, I, I mean, anyway, make a long story short, uh, fine, I liked them. And I said, Mark, I'm, just for you, I'm going to agree to meet these guys. I'll bring the bargaining committee in. But i got to tell you, you got an uphill battle uh, with me on interest-based bargaining and all of this. I'll listen to these guys. We go into Windsor, into our, our uh, local hall, local 444 uh, in, uh, in Windsor, and he brings this team in. And I forget the name of this consulting company now, but they, first he, he introduces a CEO who gives us their history of how long they've been around. They've been around for 70 years, and they, they got uh, op offices all over the world. And he was telling us about some of the largest companies in the world they've dealt with, like Boeing and IBM, and very impressive list of, um, of companies. Uh, and if he'd have stopped there, he might have got a little farther with me than he, than he did. But he, he then has said, you know, and we're not, we're not limited to just collective bargaining. He said, we do a whole lot of dispute resolution with a whole lot of people. For example, I think he said since 1957, we've been advising both the Palestinians and the Israelis on negotiating a <laughs> peace agreement. And I looked over at Mark and I said, outside, I said, Mark, give me a break. This guy's been advised. They're farther apart today than they were in 1957, Mark. So surely you can't be serious about using this, uh, this firm. And finally, our bargaining committee chair, uh, which was Kim Lewenza, who's now my, succeeded me as national president. Uh, he said to say, Mark, this ain't going to happen. We're going to do our own bargaining, and you do. We're not doing interest based. You, you got your interest, we got ours, and where they come together, great. But this guy ain't going to be any help to us. So we said, we're going to save you a lot of money. Don't pay them. Uh, send them on their way. So from your perspective, it, it just didn't work well for, for the union rank and file. Yeah, it's always, it's always you know, there's a few things that happen uh, as you grow in this uh, in this. Uh, environment that I found myself in as a chief negotiator and before that the assistant to Bob White. Uh, and one of them is you would be amazed how many companies were losing money and would come and offer us profit sharing. But if we put profit sharing on the table when they're making a lot of money, not a chance. Uh, we'd have com companies come along and say we'd like to have these joint committees on, uh, give the union uh, uh, more, more input. But it was always, well, if you do that, then we don't want to pay any wage increases. You're going to have more input and control and better understanding of, of the company. And the other was just interest-based bargaining. Every now and again, uh, these gimmicks come up. Two-tier wage system, a gimmick. Um, gain sharing, gimmick. I mean, I can name them all uh, over the years. And all of it was about trying to take advantage of the union and get the union to sell something to the workers who were their members that the company couldn't sell themselves uh, to the workers. But they tried to bring, and, uh, bring the union in and make the union a part of it, an interest-based bargaining, my total experience, what, uh, the, and that's different than working on relationships. I've worked on relationships, uh, as I said, Mark, uh, Mark uh, Jendreski, he's been, he's been gone from Chrysler now for several years, and I've been gone, we still talk. Uh, Dean Munger, who was the chief negotiator for GM during that strike in 96, him and I and his wife, we still talk. Once in a while they come over to Toronto, we have a, uh, a dinner. Uh, so I believe in building relationships and working on problems, but Take the fancy titles and set them aside and let's do what's right. Communications. You're known as a great communicator, both internally as well as externally. Uh, your communication skills as an advocate are, are very well known. Tell me about your style of communicating with your own rank and file. Uh, was the CAW uh, an internet type of uh, email to the rank and file? Was it small meetings? Was it letters to the rank and file? How did you communicate effectively with the rank and file? 
I, I, I was the national leader uh, of a union that at its peak was 265,000 members. And if you look at the auto sector, mainly Ontario, during the last few years, we used to have some in Quebec, but mainly in Ontario. Uh, but then you go to the, the airline industry, you go to the rail industry, the aerospace industry, spread right across the country. Uh, so the only way that I could communicate on a direct basis uh, was through the national media. And I, the national media used to use me to get a story, but I used them to get my story uh, out. And uh, I worked very hard at it. A, uh, I said, David, when I, when I just announced on July 12th of 2008, I was leaving the union. Um, the first thing that happened, my phone quit ringing. What a shock for me. That cell phone used to start at my place or my home phone at 5.30 in the morning from Newfoundland and Labrador and moved an hour later to Halifax to across the country and I'd end up at 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night uh, speaking to media on the, on the West Coast or speaking to local union leadership on the East or, or West Coast. Uh, and you didn't realize even how much you were doing until all of a sudden <laughs> nobody had any interest. Yes. The king is dead. Long live the king. <laughs> and I wasn't the king anymore. People were now, including the media. And the companies were all speculating who's the successor because it wasn't clear. There was a political contest going on uh, in, the, in the union, but it showed how effective the communication system was and it showed how quickly uh, it, uh, they move on to the next, uh, uh, the next person. So I used the media, uh, especially in major bargaining. But the, the, the thing that uh, I always cautioned our people on, uh, there's, and that gets to knowing the company. Uh, there's a lot of company people don't like the exposure of the media. There's a lot of company people wouldn't open that door and allow the cameras in to take a shot of the bargaining committees before they started. Uh, and you have to know that. You have to know that going in. The first thing you don't want to do is have a fight over whether or not you're going to have this media, uh, uh, what they would call media circuits, which I called communication with, uh, with our rank and file members and the broader public. Because again, if you're taking down uh, General Motors again in Oshawa at that time over 20,000 people you imagine the impact that has on small medium-sized businesses in that community you better be explaining to them as well why this dispute is uh, is there so knowing uh, when you could use the media CN rail for example when Hunter Harrison was there he's now retired uh, he, he, he didn't want the media around anywhere and and again it was a lost opportunity for both him and us to communicate with CN Rail employees who are in right across Canada, all over the country. No other way you can communicate. You can send out all the emails you want. Uh, you still have to recognize that probably 30% of our members would follow the email. I, I guess by doing that, though, you are not only communicating to your rank and file, you're also communicating to the other side. To, to the other side and the families. The families of the rank and files, because it's important for the wife sitting at home or the husband sitting at home if his wife's going on strike to understand what the national leader is saying about why there's a, a dispute or where the bargaining is at. People that, get worried. People you found that more effective than the, the email, the traditional oh, letter sure. and the fax? Oh, for sure. Now, when, now, when somebody would, would say something stupid, like the, the mayor of Windsor at one point was critical of us and our bargaining, uh, then I would very quickly put together a letter to him uh, and send it, into our, have our, send it to our local union and say, distribute this to our members. And then I'd do a, a, a media thing, release the letter, uh, to make sure that they, that because people listen to politicians. You know, when Mike Harris was beating the hell out of unions when he was elected, you'd be surprised how many workers said, well, I'd like to join the union, but, you know, Mike Harris, these guys saying unions are bad. Uh, and so today with Harper attacking the unions and ordering them back to work, that has a very cooling effect on people's uh, desires or interest in, in joining a, a union. So you have to respond. When the politicians go, go after your members, you better be out there and you better be delivering it not just to your members but to the community as well because a lot of other people are watching and listening to what happens. Tell me about your listening skills. You said this in your book. You said you must be prepared to be challenged and in some circumstances attacked. The most important thing is to listen to the local leadership and their members. If you fail to listen or avoid responding to their concerns, they'll turn on you. Any examples that you could share with us of that? Yes. I, I can give you the, 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 the examples of, of listening and, and, and talking uh, and the other side, the other group in the local not listening. We had uh, uh, back early in my presidency of the union, we had a strike deadline at, uh, at de Havilland. 
Uh, and uh, a couple years before that, de Havilland had been bought out by Bombardier. And we'd agreed to a, a settlement that gave us no wage increases, but improved our pensions a little bit for the retirees uh, for a two-year period to give Bombardier an opportunity to start doing some things. And they did. They went in they put this new operating system in this new map, what they called the Bombardier Manufacturing System, which they used around the world. And it was, a, it was foreign to our guys and very difficult for them to accept. As an example, they had uh, the, the wings for the new planes were going to be made in Japan. The fuselage was going to be made in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Ireland and other parts around the world. And they'd be all shipped into Toronto and assembled in the plant. What the guys didn't accept, they accepted that part, that the world's changing and they're going to have, they'll have more jobs than just assembling than they would have if they were doing what they used to do with the, uh, the Dash 8 uh, under de Havilland. They're going to sell more, they got a much larger market. But what they couldn't handle was the Japanese, for example, had some real quality problems with the wings. And at one point, uh, going into the bargaining, we had about 100 Japanese workers in the facility at the plant doing the work that should have been done properly in Japan. So you, our, you had Japanese workers here in Toronto? Yes. Company on the floor? Flew them in. Their company, Mitsubishi, flew them in. They put them up here in hotels, and they were in repairing or, or, or fixing what they should have done, done right the first time in, in Japan. So much for this great idea that Japanese do all the best quality. But our guys couldn't stand the idea of having a hundred foreign workers in their plant that weren't members of the union doing work that they felt should be their work, bargaining unit work. Uh, so now we're heading into bargaining. We have a strike deadline, and uh, the company, uh, the guys were fighting the company on this for a few months now. So the company presented us with what they call the supplier letter, and to simplify it, it simply said, whatever we pay for in Japan, we're not going to pay our people to do that work. We're going to bring the Japanese or the Irish or the Australians or whoever in to finish the job that we've already paid for. We're not paying twice. Pretty good argument, but our committee wasn't having any part of it. That they. So we ended up with a hell of a fight. We struck uh, the company. I went to a membership meeting, <coughs> and the chairman, he was saying, uh, we're going to strike. And I was saying, guys, this don't make any sense. And, of course, they booed the hell out of me. If you ever saw the, <laughs> the video of the negotiator, you see the one big guy wanted to sit up and said, hang on, hang on. Uh, and that's about when people, you have to be prepared for that because there's always a, a, a time when you, have to, you, have to, you may have to take a decision or a position that's different than the elected uh, uh, bargaining committee. So we finally, the chairperson of the committee, uh, I said, get on the plane, go to Montreal and, and, and talk to Bob Brown yourself. Uh, he's the guy telling us that they're going to walk away. They don't have enough money in here yet. Uh, the government of Ontario, the Bob Ray government's put most of the money in. If they shut it down, write it off, uh, they'll move on with a tax write off and, uh, and your members are going to be without work. So he did. He got in a plane and flew to Montreal and Brown told him, we're not, hey, if we can't produce the planes the way we Decide if we have to pay twice, twice to do the same work, we're not doing it here, uh, and we'll get out. We don't, we don't, we don't need to have them. We're doing very well on our own with the regional jets and them. Uh, so, we went back, and the difference now at a ratification meeting, the chairperson and the committee are recommending ratification, and I'm recommending ratification. And of course, they booed the hell out of me, but they ratified <laughs> by about the same number they rejected when I was recommended. They ratify, and uh, so you, you have to listen. Uh, but there's also a point when you have to decide whether or not listening is to the detriment of the members, whether or not the committee gets too close to us, gets too hung up on a particular uh, issue that you have. If you can't talk them out of it, then you got to put maximum pressure. Well, the maximum pressure was the strike, which they wanted, uh, the committee wanted, uh, and then the company uh, saying to me and them, uh, guys, we're not sitting here very long. If you guys don't ratify this thing, then uh, we're, we're going to move on. Um, but generally listening to make sure you don't misread where, where people are at. Every caucus uh, in the morning, uh, I would leave, the, using the GM example again, a caucus meeting after two hours, and before I ever got to meet the company, they would always, inevitably, be one or two of the bargaining committee would ask to see me individually and come up to my office in the Royal York Hotel and say, oh, look, this is what you heard there. This is what's happening. This is what you heard. Uh, this is uh, what's happening. So you See, had to be open to those folks and listen to them.